Hello and welcome to This Day. I'm BJ Arnett, your host. I hope you're having a great day and we expect that everything that God gives us to share with you will make your day even better. Today our guest is an, a renowned author who also authored First Things, the uh, three works of evangelism with acclaim in 2022 and now this book which is totally fascinating. Life in the negative world, confronting challenges in an anti-Christian culture. Please welcome Aaron Wren. Thank you so much for joining us. This is, first of all, the title is chock full of, I've got 20 questions right there. <laughs> but tell us about why this book and why now? Sure. Well, as you uh, said, it really originated in an article that I wrote for First Things magazine that really went viral because it helps people make sense of many of the crazy things that we see in a culture around us. And it's a look at really how the view of society towards Christianity has changed since the 1960s. If you go back to the 1950s, we were still basically a Protestant Christian normative society. We had prayer in schools, uh, for example. And of course, America was not run necessarily in line with all Christian values at that time, but Christianity was held in honor. And then in the 60s, uh, Christianity started to go in decline in America. Uh, from, say, 1964 to the present, this period of decline can be broken into three basic phases or worlds that I call the positive, neutral, negative world. So in the positive world, 64 to 94, Christianity's in decline, I want to say that, but also still viewed positively. In around 1994, we had a tipping point. We enter what I call the neutral world, uh, where from 1994 to 2014, Christianity is no longer viewed positively by society, but not really viewed negatively either. And then in 2014, we had a sort of second tipping point in which, for the first time really in the whole history of the country, kind of elite official culture sort of views Christianity negatively. The uh, old moral systems of Christianity are explicitly rejected. And in some respects, uh, at least some Christians are viewed as a threat to sort of the new moral order. And uh, I argue that a lot of what we see, especially in the evangelical world, which is my focus, is a result of sort of the pressures of this negative world bearing down on the groups within it. Well, what is interesting about that, I, I love what you said about the, uh, the tipping point. As we look throughout history, there have been many tipping points throughout history of our lack of stick to to the will and the way of God. Granted. But then you said in 1994 and in 2014, this tipping point looks different. What was the tipping point in 1994 in your estimation? And then again in 2014 in your estimation? We need to take a look at that and really do a compare and contrast, I do believe. Yeah, so uh, I, I would just argue, you know, Christianity's status in society was sort of in decline. And so we were going to tip at some point from positive into neutral and then from neutral into negative. Uh, in 1994, uh, this was the one I debated a lot. Should I go with 1994 or 1989? Mm. Because you could argue that 1989 was the big one because that was the fall of the Soviet Union. And, you know, when America was essentially involved in a Cold War with you know, godless communism, as they called it, Christianity was really bound up with the West in its war against the Soviet Union. Yes. You couldn't say, well, we're going to get rid of Christianity as long as we're still fighting Russia, basically. Well, with the fall of the Soviet Union, that sort of changed things um, a lot. I think there was also, in, in the 90s, a real renaissance of urban centers like New York and Chicago. Not all of them obviously came back at the same time, but a lot of them did. And this sort of urban progressive um, kind of white hipster culture that we came began to emerge. And uh, Rudy Giuliani became mayor of New York in 1994. Yes. And I really thought that was, that was a, a big one uh, that happened there. So those are a few things that were going on. And I think part of it is just that, you know, as, as we can kind of went into a post-Cold War world, um, then, you know, we were able to essentially separate out kind of Christianity from the overall culture in a way that wasn't feasible for. Mm -hmm. I think 2014 is an interesting one because clearly there's a lot of things you, you could look at there. But I would say um, 
certainly the, the views on sexuality in the culture really changed enormously in a very short period of time. And again, what's the precise date? We can debate that. But if you think of 2008, both Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton ran for president in public opposition to gay marriage. And in fact, in 2008, the voters in California, yeah, California, like what we think of as the bluest state in the country, mm -hmm. voted to make uh, ban gay marriage in the Constitution of California. You know, by 2015, we have the uh, Obergefell decision that legalizes uh, gay marriage. And now it's like the, the skirmish line in the culture war, if you want to call it that, is mm -hmm. should transgender athletes be able to compete in girls' sports? Yes, it is. So from uh, Barack Obama opposing gay marriage to, to that is a very rapid change. So when we look at all of these shifts and changes within our culture, that points to uh, a pull away from Christianity. Now we're in 2024, and we're about to embark on another shift. We're watching uh, uh, wars that are escalating, you know, we watch the news and we say, oh, you know, you hear of all of this help that the United States is, is sending out. But there's a war within these United States that doesn't look like what we see everywhere else. How do you see that we should address what is happening at this point as we move further into 2024 and then 2025? Yes, well, Undoubtedly, for people who are sort of Bible-believing Christian types, this is a really unprecedented mm -hmm. uh, situation, particularly for people who are, you know, I'm in my 50s, or people who are, you know, baby boomers who grew up in this sort of Christian-centric society. Uh, it's hard to make that adjustment. But I also think that we need to be careful not to just take these trends and kind of project them forward into the future. You make a great point about wars. I mean, just in the last, you know, several years— there's been so many things that totally came out of the blue uh, that nobody could predict. Mm -hmm. You know, in January 1, 2015, nobody in their right mind would have said two years later, Donald Trump would be the president of the United States. Nobody was expecting a pandemic. People were not expecting these wars that are coming up in Ukraine and the Middle East. And so there's tremendous uncertainty. And like, what's going to happen with our election? What's going to happen uh, with the economy? It's, it's really, really uncertain. And so I think... Uh, we we got to resist the urge to think that we have it all figured out. Uh -huh. And true. And we have to. True. And what I, and I, I think you know we have to to adopt what I call the posture of exploration. Mm -hmm. And the example that I use, the parallel to the Bible, is when uh, the the Hebrews were crossing the Jordan River to enter the Promised Land after wandering in the desert for forty years. You had a group of people who'd spent their whole lives in this desert. Maybe it wasn't a great place, but they understood it. It was their, their environment, and now they're going into this unknown territory where all they know is there's these very fearsome people who aren't going to give it up without a fight. And in the book of Joshua, there's a line to the extent where someone tells the people, follow the ark across the Jordan River because you have not been this way before. Right. And so I think we have to, to be more comfortable in the unknown and be more comfortable walking more by faith than by sight, maybe than we— would in the past, we sort of thought we had it figured out. We understood how the world works. Yeah, we, we don't understand uh, some of this stuff. Every day there's another news article I can't believe. And, and so I think we have to, you know, again, keep, keep our eyes on Christ. Walk by faith, not by sight. Uh, you know, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and he will make your path straight. Those sorts of, of paradigms. And, and we're not just going to be able to come up with some, you know, a strategy that's just going to work right away. We're going to have to explore this new terrain. You know, there there is the question of the um, uh, the uh, uh, church and its responsibility in this story, if you will, in perpetuating the the pull away from the will and way of God or standing in the will and way of God. What do you see the church's uh, direct answer should be to all of the cultural and societal changes that we're coming against? What should be coming off of the lips of the uh, uh, evangelical uh, church? Sure, well, I uh, talk about like 
ideas about how should we start thinking about responding to this across three dimensions in the book, what I call the personal, like our, ourselves and our families, institutional, the church, and then missional. I think for churches, there are a couple things that I, that I will highlight there. One is that, um, you know, we need to, you know, essentially take, take the logs out of our own eyes. I mean, every time I open the paper, yep. there's some other scandal yes. about financial improprieties, mm -hmm. abuse that was covered up, mm -hmm. all sorts of dodgy people who are not following God's word. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we need to clean up our own act a little bit. I think we do. And, you know, the Bible says that judgment begins with the household Absolutely. of God. So yes. we need to be uh, really taking care of that business. Now, maybe, you know, your church or some particular church where you, somebody's attending is doing well, and that's great, but a whole lot of them aren't. And so some of the critics uh, of, you know, the church of evangelicalism, we're not wrong in that. A second one is to um, focus much more on kind of the strength and the health of the church itself. Mm, There's a line um, mm -hmm. out there that uh, uh, was from England in the 1900s. I can't remember the exact gentleman's name who said it. It's something to the effect of the church is the only organization that exists for the benefit of people who are not yet members. The idea is reaching the loss. And the Great Commission, we can never lose sight of that. But we also have to strengthen our own community because we can't rely, for example, on the public schools to teach basic Christian morality like you could in the past. You can't assume that society will essentially reinforce your values or is built in, in a source of your values. And that means like, um, you know, you know, especially for the white evangelical, like minority groups, they need to think more about how do we steward the strength of our own community so that we pass on faith to our children and they live faithfully and we have something to invite people into. That doesn't mean you have to hate other people or hate the outside world, but it does mean you have to think much more strongly about passing on our, here's what we do. Here's how the world operates, but here's what we do. And so we're going to have to have a much stronger sense of that internal to our own communities. Focusing on the strength of our own communities is going to be very important. I think uh, that uh, within itself is very, very true, because in order to be able to grow, we've got to look generationally. What we are saying today will affect the generations to come. What we are doing will affect the generations to come. We must focus on the strength within our communities that will resonate in years to come, our children and our children's children. I want to thank you so much for joining us today here on this day. Uh, the book is Life in the Negative World, Confronting Challenges in an Anti-Christian Culture. Let's make sure that we shift the culture and make sure that we are giving our children and our children's children the foundation that God has given us to stand on, live on, and to progress to the next level. For interesting conversation, for interesting word, and to make you think this is not for the faint of heart, you must go and find out more from AaronRen.com. That's Aaron R E. N .com. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. What an, uh, an amazing story and a, a perspective to look at in order for us to get to that next level. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we, you know we love you, but we charge you with the responsibility to be e-doers of the word, not hearers only. Don't deceive yourself. In Jesus' name, God bless.